Okay, still hanging in there? That's good. Huh? <laughs> so let's have a look at some of the uh, questions uh, and uh, see what happens. If you wonder why it is that I'm usually awake after the meal, it's because I have a really strong cup of coffee. That's why. Uh, so kind of <laughs> gets you going here. Yeah. Okay, so uh, here we go. Okay, question number one, two, three, four. Wow, okay, this is really <laughs> getting in there. When the Buddha talked about the world system or world cycle, is he referring to the planetary system, the galaxies, or the universe? Okay, so the usual word you find in the suttas is a word called loka datu, and datu means like almost like element or something like that, or property or something, and loka is world. And the way it is defined is defined as the planet Earth, the moon and the sun, and all the beings that live in dependence on that. Yeah? So it's basically a solar system, seems to be what it refers to, a solar system like the sun and the planets going around it. That seems to be the thing. But then you, he talks about a thousand such world systems, a thousand to the second power, a million such world systems, and a thousand to the third power, a billion such world systems. So he talks about something also very large structures as well. And all of these are the same kind of structure. Sun, planet, moon, and beings that live in dependence of that. So he's bit literally talking about billions of solar systems with planets and beings on them. Yeah? We discussed this actually earlier on in the retreat. Uh, probably you, you weren't here yet at the time, but that was uh, uh, at that time. So that is what the, world, the word world system is talking about. World cycle is something else. Uh, cycle would be something that goes around, yeah? comes back to the beginning, It'd be more like the um, uh, cup, uh, kappa is an eon, uh, and you have a kappa of evolution, a kappa of devolution. So it, things evolve, and then they contract again, or they evolve and then they disintegrate, something like that. Uh, yeah? So the idea in, in Pali was very interesting, because the word in Pali is almost exactly the same word that we have in English. Sang vattati, the word vatta means to roll. In, Eng in uh, the English word evolve comes from the Latin root, which means volve. Volve means to turn, same thing, rolling around. So evo evolution and vivattati is almost exactly the same word uh, and has the idea of things moving out, then coming back again. So quite likely that refers to the contraction of the cosmos, the expansion of the cosmos, yeah, something like the Big Bang. It seems natural to interpret in that way, although you cannot be absolutely certain that's what it means, because it doesn't talk exactly in the same vocabulary that we use now, so it's hard to make exact parallels. Uh, that seems to be the, the reference. Okay, next one. Oh, this gets interesting, okay. Number two, the power to walk through walls, walk on water, fly through the air, etc is mentioned in the suttas. Can these really happen? <laughs> Can they really happen? It's a good question. And uh, the, the, the first thing to understand is that these are, in the suttas, they are just byproducts of developing the mind. Yeah? If you develop the mind, then according to the suttas, in a few places, uh, these things are supposedly possible. Yeah? Yeah, so uh, it is a byproduct, but it's not an important thing in the suttas. This doesn't actually lead you anywhere. It is not awakening in its own right. It's just a power that you can have, uh, but it doesn't have any insight or anything like that coming with it. So these things are secondary. Yeah, even if you took all that completely out of the suttas, uh, it wouldn't make an ounce of difference as far as the dhamma is concerned. The dhamma will still be the same. Uh, However, there are some psychic powers that do make a difference, and those psychic powers, called abhinyas, is the ability to recall your past lives, understand the laws of kama, and of course the awakening experience. These things are fundamental. If you don't have those, the dhamma falls apart. Whereas these ones here, they are additional, they don't really matter. So is it possible? I think it's possible. The reason is, is because uh, the way we normally think about the world, the world is actually very different from that. The world is much more mental than we think. Modern ideas of materialism is that the mind is a byproduct of material phenomena, 
And that's just a kind of philosophy, yeah? Nobody has really proved that. Nobody has been able to show what the mind actually is. Nobody has been able to show how the mind can arise out of material phenomena. How can you have electrons and protons spin and charges and mass and these things and somehow have a personal experience? How can personal experience arise from this other stuff? Nobody had even any idea how that's possible. So a Buddhist point of view, it is much better to start with personal experience. That is the basic thing, yeah? And then you are making mind a more fundamental building block of the world. And as soon as mind is a more fundamental building block of the world, then suddenly it opens up possibilities in terms of these kind of things. So yeah, I think we need to see some of the limits of the modern science. I mean, science is there's nothing wrong with it, uh, but it hasn't encompassed everything yet. And one thing it hasn't encompassed uh, is mind. It doesn't really understand mind. It's missing in modern science. Uh, and this is a big problem in science. Uh, philosophers call it the hard problem of consciousness because it is so difficult and intractable. And the reason why it is intractable is because they have started from the wrong place in a sense. Uh, you can read this. If you read a little bit of philosophy, I wouldn't recommend you to do too much, but you very quickly come across this this problem in modern philosophy here. Yeah. It's discussed a lot, and there seems to be a movement towards changing yeah, our... Uh, this is all Western philosophy, yeah, very different from uh, <coughs> kind of Indian ideas, uh, all Western stuff. Uh, so, And that is why I think it has been really sidetracked by kind of, uh, you know, a few decades of what, what you call materialist philosophy. And it doesn't really work, it doesn't really get to the bottom of things. Uh, so they're going to have to change it somehow and expand it and, and uh, whatever. Okay, is rebirth, question number three, is rebirth immediate? In one of his talks, Ajahn Brahm mentioned a case in Thailand where he observed the disease took re rebirth took 49 days. And during this 49 days, what state of existence, plane, realm, is it called? Okay. Uh, so this is one of those standard questions in Theravada Buddhism, because uh, according to the Theravada Abhidhamma, rebirth takes place straight away. But there's also the theory of the Antara Bhava. Antara means like... Uh, intermediate existence, antara means between, bhava means existence, it means between existence. So the question is, is it rebirth straight away or is there intermediate existence? Or maybe these two are just different ways of talking about the same thing. Maybe the antra bhava is a kind of existence. Yeah, These are all the different theories. And uh, it seems to me that uh, this was a big argument uh, a few centuries after the Buddha. And you can read about this, there's a book in the Pali Abhidhamma called the Katavattu, which means like the basis of discussion or something like that, where they discuss all of these things and the Theravada takes the Theravada position and then it argues against the other schools of Buddhism. And Theravada always argues against the intermediate position, whereas other schools argue for it. But uh, if you read the suttas, I would say the case is very strong that the un there is such a thing as antra bhava in the suttas. Uh, there's a lot, quite a bit of evidence for that. So I think that is correct. And I think this is one of the cases where the Theravada tradition actually goes against the suttas. Uh, so this is what I mean. You don't sometimes, you know, are you a Theravada monk or what, what kind of person are you? And I consider myself a sutta Buddhist. I go back to the word of the Buddha. I don't necessarily uh, agree with all the Theravada positions as such. Uh, I'm more interested in what the Buddha taught. Uh, so um, that is, seems to be there. So yes, I think the idea that there can be 49 days in between, sure, that, I think that's quite possible. Yeah, you are kind of waiting for your kamma to ripen, so to speak, and then you get reborn. Uh, what state of existence is it? Well, it's called the antra bhava. You're kind of waiting in a kind of play, in a kind of ghost-like state, perhaps. Uh, a bit like the, uh, what happens when you have a near-death experience, you go out of your body, uh, yeah, and then you sort of stay there for a while until the uh, rebirth happens. What are the three misconducts? Three misconducts are body, speech, and mind. Uh, yeah? So these are, this, this includes everything. Body, speech, and mind, there's nothing, no misconduct outside of those three categories. Uh. Okay.
Din Ajana, how does one deal with office politics? <laughs> yes, I'm an expert in office politics. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> it's just like everything else, yeah? Office politics is just people, people's stuff, people's things coming out, uh, and it's just people doing things to advance themselves and block others or jealousies or ill will or greed and these things coming out in the office. That's really all it is. It's just a standard human repertoire of problems. Uh, that's what office politics is all about. Uh, so you have to deal with it as you deal with any kind of human situation, just like you were talking about before. Uh, and uh, often best to kind of stay as much out of the office politics as you possibly can, uh, not to you get involved, yeah, and just kind of see if you're able to stay out. That's really the ideal thing. And just uh, do your work, as I was mentioning the other day, about uh, if you are on a committee, same thing, or you're part of a BGF, do your little job. Be happy with that. Don't get too involved with the political side, because usually it is just endless, and it very easily leads to heated arguments. Uh, and just remember that the reason why people do things that are unfair and unreasonable and political is because of defilements, yeah, because of their conditioning, their background. They probably want to do the best, uh, but they are blind like everyone else. Uh, don't get too upset if other people get involved in office politics. Uh, instead of getting upset, uh, have compassion for them. They are suffering. As long as you can stand out, uh, yeah, stand away from it uh, and do your own thing and carry on, uh, you are probably in a much better place than they are. Uh, so just the usual thing, yeah, remember, people are conditioned, uh, people are silly, people are blind, people are deluded, people don't know what they're doing, yeah. nobody knows what they're doing. Hopefully we know a little bit better, yeah, that's why we're kind of on this path. Uh. And uh, when people don't know what they're doing, yeah, have compassion, uh, because that is just uh, the right way of dealing with things. Uh. They're causing trouble for themselves and others, but especially for themselves. Uh. If you cause trouble for them yourself uh, while thinking that you could creating something good for yourself, then compassion is the only uh, natural outcome for that. Number two, when selling a product, should one disclose all the negative aspects of it? Hence, risk losing the sale. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I, I think being a salesman is inherently kind of, you know, difficult because you, I, I, it, it's very hard to kind of, how can you, dis you're going to be biased, every salesman is biased, how can you not be biased, that's the whole point, uh, yeah, you're biased towards your product, uh, that's the point of being a salesman, isn't it? Uh, so you shouldn't, you should try to be fair, yeah, you shouldn't kind of oversell or, or anything like that, but uh, uh, you know, and if they ask you for a comparison with other products, then maybe you, you should say something about the comparison. But uh, you, you, I, I don't really know the answer to that one. You should be reasonable. That's what I, all I would say. You shouldn't oversell. You shouldn't kind of lead them to make a bad decision. But if you really believe your product is better, and presumably that's why you are selling for your company, because you really believe it, then of course you sell it in that way. You sell it because you think it's best. Yeah. You tell them, I, I think it's better because of this, this is what really matters. And then you're being honest, you're just following your heart. But of course, you have some bias, I mean, otherwise you... And I think the customer will pro hopefully will understand that every salesman is going to have some bias, otherwise they wouldn't be doing their job, presumably. Yeah. So find a middle way somewhere, don't lie, don't exaggerate and all these things. But uh, uh, it's obvious that you want to that your product is, is better, otherwise you wouldn't be selling it, I presume. Dear <coughs> everyone thinks differently, have their own perspectives and views, hence clashes or disagreements are inevitable. One, could you please share how does the Sangha resolve these differences, opinions and views amicably? Um, basically, the Sangha is based on a uh, democratic system, yeah? So whenever we make a decision as a group, as a Sangha, uh, we come together and if one person disagrees on something, then that stops the anything from being done. So everyone has to agree here. Yeah? And this is one of those great ways that creates harmony and unity here, yeah? because it means no one is left out. Uh. And you may think that it's uh, 
hopeless task if everyone has to agree, because if you all, everyone has different views and opinions, how can everyone ever get to agree? But the way you do that is that if one person is strongly against something or has a problem with something, you try to find out what it is, yeah? And then you try to find a balance or a, or a middle point somewhere. Or if there is no way of finding that uh, harmony, then you ask them, are you willing to relinquish your view for the sake of the majority? Yeah? And oh, when you do all of those things, then often you get to an agreement somehow, yeah? That is how you end up making decisions uh, amicably. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you just don't get anywhere and you can't do anything. Then you are blocked from acting. Yeah? But sometimes it's better not to act than to lose the harmony. Yeah? That's one way. Another way we do things in the Sangha, and all of this is actually based on the ancient Buddhist ideas you find in the Vinaya. So it's very, quite interesting here. Yeah? So obviously ancient India would have had a very strong democratic tradition because you find those democratic principles laid down specifically in the Vinaya. The other way is that you have delegated authority. It's also a very important principle of the Vinaya. Delegate authority means you have an officer, someone acting on behalf of the Sangha. Yes, yeah, so you have one person in charge of the store, one person in charge of guests to hand, hand out, hand out uh, rooms or cuties, uh, one person in charge of robes, yeah? So they are given delegated authority, that means that they are in charge of that area, and then the Sangha doesn't have a say here. So this is a way of then, you know, not everyone being involved with everything, otherwise it becomes a logjam where everyone has to agree on everything here. And then you watch what those officers do, and if they behave reasonably, they can carry on. If they do something wrong, then the Sangha will say, wait, you have gone beyond your authority or whatever. Yeah. Number two, without hurting someone's pride and without trying to change a person, how do we then bring this disillusioned person back on the righteous path? Uh, <coughs> if this person is still in denial and does not want our help, is it then time to let go and concentrate on self-healing instead of continuing being hurt? Probably, yes, probably the answer, you probably have already found the answer yourself. I would say it sounds like that's a very good idea. If you cannot really affect anything, concentrate on yourself, yeah? I think that's a much better way of doing things. Uh, often life is like that. There are some people who are outside of our scope of influence, yeah? That's okay. A lot of people are like that, it doesn't matter here. Uh, so you just leave it. Uh. And uh, sometimes if you don't show any interest in changing somebody, that is often when people start to change. Yeah, because people feel that they have you in a kind of in a grip somehow. If you want to change them, they have power over you. Yeah, because uh, you want to change them and they don't change, well then they can control you to some extent, your emotions or whatever, by kind of playing with you. But if you don't care, if you don't really whatever, then they lose that power. And at the moment they lose power, they may the view of life will change and they will start to focus more on themselves uh, and what they need to change. Yeah? So sometimes wanting to change someone, uh, s actually that very wanting stops them from changing. The moment you stop the wanting, then maybe they will want to change. Uh, not necessarily, it may not make any difference at all, but it can happen sometimes. So. How do we balance between giving our all unconditional love and compassion versus prioritizing our own well-being and mental sanity? Yes, yeah, please stay sane, don't go nuts, because that, that doesn't help anyone. So, uh, uh, ideally, they should go together, yeah? Have love and compassion uh, to the extent that you feel it is helpful for yourself, that you, you know, when you are compassionate and kind to somebody, then you will feel a boost in energy usually, but there comes a point when you're just exhausting yourself. So know when that point comes, uh, and then withdraw. Uh, recharge your batteries, uh, do a bit of meditation practice, uh, listen to some good Dhamma talks, uh, yeah, whatever it is, uh, and then bring things back up again. Uh. So remember, a lot of this idea of love and compassion does not necessarily need to be expressed to other people. Yeah? It is a mental state that you have. Uh, and you can have compassion and love all the time inside of yourself, not necessarily always expressing it. It's when you express it that it often becomes 
exhausting because then you have to deal with people and dealing with people is usually where the exhaustion comes in. You can only deal so much with other people. Uh, but the feeling of compassion and love can, in a sense, can always be there. You just know your limits in terms of how often you express it outwardly to other people. Uh, and that is, uh, knowing that limit is important. Uh, yeah? It's like, it's, it's always interesting, every year I get to, I speak to Bobby about, you know, how we should, the schedule we should have here and how many talks we should give. Uh, and then Bobby says, yeah, four talks and Q&A in the evening and guided meditation. I think, cheapest, can I do all of this? I'm gonna, am I going to exhaust myself? I try to think, what is the limit to the number of talks you can possibly give? Yeah, and Bobby doesn't know my limits. He thinks I'm like some kind of machine who thinks he can just talk forever. <laughs> but <laughs> unfortunately not. So, <clears throat> so sometimes you have to kind of know how much... This is exactly the you know, same problem I am faced with as well, basically. And these are the sort of things we try to negotiate every year to find a balanced thing here. So we can talk about that later on, Bobby. What is the, what is the for the future? If if it happens again, what how to find the right balance in this? Uh, so please look after yourself. It's important. Something you have to do as a monk, as a layperson. Everybody needs to do this. Uh, otherwise, things don't work out. Okay. In the Sutta at Kosambi, the Buddha seems to be laying down a kind of team charter for the community that lives together so that they can work well as a tight group. How can we apply the same principle in Buddhist Center like BGF or any Buddhist society so that we work better with each other? Yes. <laughs> this is this is not easy, yeah, and, and even if you put that charter down and everyone kind of signs the bottom line and agrees to keep to it, still you're going to have arguments probably. But uh, the, I think the most important thing, one of the things that works well for the Buddhist society of WA is that you have someone like Ajahn Brahm who is a spiritual director on the committee. And what that means is that in the presence of a monk, everybody tends to be more, a bit more cool, yeah? They don't get so angry and upset because it's just that that feeling of some sort of uh, spiritual presence or whatever that makes people think slightly differently. Yeah? And that is one of the things about any committee c uh, work is that if you have someone on your board who can everyone respects in a high way, I don't know, maybe someone like Dr. Victor, we I don't know, you know how this works, or maybe someone else that is respected. If they are there and present, even as a spiritual director, then hope maybe the community will be more in harmony and more careful how they speak. And also, that spiritual director can remind people, okay, please, you know, please, you know, this let's kind of get the tone right and all these kind of things. Let's talk to each other with kindness, even though we are passionate about things. So that is one way of doing it, and that's one reason why at BSWA in Perth we do have the monastics as spiritual directors and they are present at committee meetings. Uh, we now have three spiritual directors. We have Ajahn Brahm is spiritual director, then we have a second assistant spiritual director, and no, first and second assistant spiritual director. Yeah? So sometimes there is two or three monastics on that committee. So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is just to you can apply the principles we apply in the Vinaya, like I mentioned before. I don't know if it would actually work in the real world where everyone has to be in agreement yeah, before you make a decision. Maybe it will lead to gridlock, I don't know. But you can try to use those principles because the beauty of that is that when no one is left out, then no one feels like a loser afterwards. Yeah? If everyone has kind of got on bored with the decision, uh, then uh, it won't lead a negative, lingering feeling afterwards. Uh, but if one side has to lose and one side has to win, uh, it always lead, leads to a fe negative feeling carried on afterwards. At least some people have it like that. Not everyone, perhaps, but some people feel like you know, they're not good losers, in a sense, uh, if you lose the debate or whatever it is. Uh. So uh, that is another way of, uh, of doing that. But in general, uh, Come into the committee, do your job, know what your job is. Don't take uh, the politics so seriously, just be a quiet person who does your job. That is often also a very good way of going about things. And uh, often, these are the people who I find most impressive, who just do what they have to do without kind of getting involved 
too much with the, the politics side of things. Uh, so it's hard. There's no easy solutions. Uh, but uh, maybe try some of those ideas and see what you think. Okay, dear Ajahn, since the Buddha's time, there have been many well-practiced laymen and laywomen. So, so some were even anagamis. Wouldn't it be better to better deal to stay as a layman, laywoman, enjoying the best of both worlds. Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so uh, the um, answer to that question is that it is true if you read the suttas, there are occasional lay people who are said to be anagamis, uh, and, uh, and maybe they were at the time of the Buddha, yeah? But uh, if you look around the world, uh, I don't know how many Lay anagamis do you see in the world today? Mm, I, I, I'm not sure if there are that many. And uh, how many lay stream mentors do you see? I, it's hard to know. I, as far as I'm concerned, maybe I don't think there are that many. It's, it's difficult. Yeah, It's very hard to live the full life uh, of a um, renunciate as a lay person because you are surrounded by distractions and all kind of things and the chances of you making it in the same way as the renunciate is actually very small. Remember that to be an anagami you are essentially a monastic. Yeah? You have almost given up everything in the world. You have given up your interest in the sensual world so not, you don't really have a partner anymore. You probably live by yourself yeah, in a house. You're not really interested in all the belongings you have because you're given all that up. You kind of enter jhana all the time, so you're kind of a monastic but living in lay life. So you have to kind of straddle these two things and the only reason why people would do that is because they had obligations they couldn't get away from. They, in their heart they probably yearned to become monastics. Please, I want to be monastic, but I have no, I have these obligations to my mother and father and employees or whatever, so I have to carry on. But in their heart they probably were desperate to leave the household life because they had no interest there anymore. So you're not actually enjoying the best of both worlds at all. You're kind of getting the worst of both worlds. Uh, that's the reality of it. Uh, yeah? You're not getting to be a proper renunciant nor a proper householder. Uh, so the further down your path you are, the more your heart inclines to solitude, uh, to being by yourself, uh, to just enjoying the bliss of the mind. That is what your heart inclines to. Where can you find that the most easy? By being a householder or being a monastic? far easier as a monastic, right? You are given a cutie in the forest, you're given the opportunities to be by yourself, you don't have a wife or husband, don't have any children, yeah. I, I'm sure there's a lot of joy in having children, I have no doubt about that, I'm sure. But at the same time, I don't have any desire at all to have children, absolutely zero desire, I have no, no regrets whatsoever not having any children. And uh, so there is just a different outlook, yeah? You enjoy something else differently. Yeah? And, uh, so, and once you get into that, you don't really want it to be any different. Uh. So it, it is not really the case that you enjoy both worlds. Uh, usually if you lean to monastic life, uh, you always, that's where you want to be here. Yeah? And you cannot really enjoy lay life fully as long as you have that leaning towards seclusion and quietness and living a pure life. Uh. There is a clash there between the two, and that is the problem. Uh. So I, w I w you know, if, if that is your leaning, if you feel that this is the right way, then it is much better. But it's not just that, there's many, many other things about monastic life which are very powerful. One is the fact that you live with like-minded people, uh, you get a fairly close interaction with good teachers like Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Ganha, Lumpur Liam. Uh, you get closer to the word of the Buddha because you have regular classes and discussions about the Buddhist teachings, uh, yeah? Your whole life is uh, dedicated to one thing and everything you do is meaningful. This is one of the things I love about the Dhamma of being a Buddhist monk. Everything I do is meaningful. Uh, yeah, when I work, when I do anything, everything is towards one goal, one purpose. Nothing detracts from what, what I'm doing. Uh, well, I, maybe not nothing, but you know, <laughs> Few things detract from what I'm doing. Yeah. Occasionally I might read a newspaper and these things, but you know what it's like. Yeah. So in that sense, it is a very meaningful kind of existence. Uh, either I do some translation, I do meditation work, I do work in a monastery, everything is charity. I don't really get anything for myself except for uh, you know, whatever spiritual qualities I build up in myself. Uh, when you give a donation to 
you know, to Bodhidharma Monastery. It has nothing to do with me personally. It goes to the monastery building program or paying uh, electricity bills or something like that. I don't have any personal benefit. And that is actually the best way to give. If you give for no reason, if you don't give to get anything back, it's a much purer form of giving, much more joyful. This is what you get in monastic life. You never get that in lay life. So you have perfect conditions, yeah? It's living in acuity, everything is focused on one thing. Yeah? You have good teachers around you to support you. Yeah? So I, you know, I, I think the monastic life is just absolutely uh, brilliant. There's a reason why the Buddha laid it down. If lay life was good enough, uh, he would never have laid down the monastic life. There's a reason why it's laid down, because it is the highway to building up spiritual qualities. That's why it is there. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to, how do you help a person undergoing depression? A friend of mine ha had, has had depression for two or three years. It is better now, but we still have depressive episodes every month or every two months. He is a strong Christian. How to help him as a good friend? Thank you. Um, depression is really the, the, it's, a, it's a way of thinking. You have, your thinking has gone into a bad loop, basically. That's what depression is. Uh, yeah? I think mo many people have had some depressive episodes in their lives when they felt really down, they felt really dark. Yeah, it happens to many, many people, but most people, they kind of come out of it fairly quickly. For some people, it can linger on for a long period of time. It's just a way of thinking. Your thinking has gone wrong. Yeah? And because your thinking has gone wrong, you need to learn to think differently. Yeah? And uh, you need to learn to think about the positives of life. And anyone can think themselves out of depression if they understand how to do it. Uh, and one of the ways of doing that is to count the blessings in your life. Yeah? To understand that if you are a good person, then you are always heading towards more positive qualities, more positive states. Uh, so remember that actually, I'm a Buddhist or I'm a Christian. I'm living well. It means that I have a bright future. If I have a bright future, every reason to be happy, yeah? But if your future looks dark, that is when you get depressed. Not to rely too much on material things in the world. If you rely too much on material things of the world, it's another recipe for depression, because they are so unreliable. If you rely on the unreliable, it's a bad idea. Don't rely on the, don't rely on the unreliable. Can you unrely on the reliable? No. Uh, don't rely on the unreliable. That's, that's, that's probably the better way. So, then, that is why people who are too much into materialistic things often get really depressed, because they don't have any deeper values that really matter for them. Uh, so this is what, how that person needs to think. Count their blessings. Actually, I've got many good things. I've got this Buddhist friend of mine who's trying to help me out. I should be happy. Yeah, I've got many other things happening in my life. Uh, and these negative things that are happening that are making me depressed, I can probably deal with that. It will eventually disappear. This too will pass. Carry on. Yeah into the future. Uh, this too will end eventually. Uh, and then gradually you can uh, uh, hopefully help them to think differently, to see the positive in life and move away from the darkness. Uh, but you can also invite them to come to one of Ajahn Brahm's talks. Uh, and you can say to Ajahn Brahm, oh, can you talk a bit about depression? Most of the things, many of the things Ajahn Brahm says are going to be just a, a kind of Common sense doesn't matter whether you're Buddhist or a Christian. Yeah, it's kind of irrelevant. So you can uh, ask them to come along. Don't ask them to come along to one of my talks because I say, you know, the things I say. You heard what I keep on saying. So don't don't do that. But Ajahn Brahm is okay here. Yeah. yeah, Ajahn Brahm, you can tell. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm will work out. Yeah. So, um, so, so little things like that. Sometimes it can also be good to see a psychiatrist, yeah, if you are really depressed, and they might give you some medicine, there's nothing wrong with taking some antidepressants for a while to help you over things, yeah, while you resettle, that is another possibility, many people do that these days, it used to be kind of stigmatized a little bit to t do these things, but you're getting less and less stigmatized in the world to uh, take some medicines to help you out if you have these kind of problems, so all of those are valid ways of, of dealing with this. 
So, but it's difficult, yeah? And the, some of the most important things you can do as a friend is just to be caring and kind and supportive. Uh, and, uh, and that is a, already a wonderful thing, yeah, yeah? Especially if you are a Buddhist and they are a Christian, that will always make a good impression if you do it that way. Yes, please. Um, uh, relating to the one of the questions just now uh, regarding lay anagami, I think yeah. uh, uh, the, o the the only sutta that I know uh, is Gatikara Sutta, and the description of his life is the material wealth is very spartan and very minimal. I wonder if there's any other sutta that talks about other lay anagami. Are, are they similar in in those? I uh, mean, in terms of material possessions, those kind of things? It, it varies a lot. Uh, there, are, there are, in the suttas, there are a number of lay people who are said to be anagamis. Uh, for example, if you go to the uh, numerical discourse, Anguttara Nikaya 1s, uh, it talks about the, uh, the lay people who were kind of the preeminent lay people at that time. Uh, there was the one who was the preeminent in, in wisdom. Uh, I think that was Chitta, a layman called Chitta. I think he was number one in wisdom. Uh, I think. Uh, and he was an anagami, and he had, I think if, it looks like he had a fairly large estate, and he was supporting monks and things from this estate. So he had some kind of business that he had to keep going, or some kind of responsibility. And there was another uh, layman called um, Hattaka of Alavi, he's another one who was supposed to be an anagami, and he had a large entourage of 500 people. He was this incredibly popular person, because he was practicing the uh, uh, Sangha Vattu, as we talked about before, so he was gathering this large crowd around him. So he seemed to have been fairly prominent as well. Uh, and then there's another one talking about as Uga, Uga the householder. Uh, these are very short suttas in the Anguttara Nikaya, talks about these people. And Uga the householder, he had three wives, uh, and when he became an anagama, he said to his wives, okay, well, you know, find yourself a new husband. That's what he said to them. Uh, yeah, I please go because you know you can stay here if you want to, but uh, if you want to find a new husband, that's okay. So a couple of his wives left, and one of his wives stayed behind to kind of practice dhamma with him or something like that. Uh, so he was obviously quite wealthy. If you have three wives at that time, you would have to be a wealthy person uh, because, you know, of the support and all of that. Uh. And then there were some women as well who were uh, anagamis. Uh, um, Kujutara, I think, is one of them, uh, uh, and Nandamata, uh, and these were all. There's very little said about them. You don't really know exactly what their position was. These are very short suttas. The Katikara Sutta is the only long sutta which talks about anagami. The other ones are short suttas in the Anguttara and Sangutta Nikaya. So we know the names, and it says in there that they were anagamis, uh, but we don't really know much more about them. Uh. So even whether they actually were anagamis is really uncertain. I mean, a short sutta like that, which is like a memory from the past, how reliable is it? It's very hard to say here. So uh, there's a bit of information, but I would say a lot of uncertainty as well around this. Uh, yeah, so not all that helpful, unfortunately. <laughs> so. <coughs> Okay, dear favorite Ajahn, okay, now we are talking. This is the kind of question I like to answer. <laughs> so, during death contemplation session yesterday, I was only able to visualize or imagine death based on your instructions from a third person standpoint. I was like a third party watching myself from a distance on the deathbed instead of being the person who is in the deathbed itself. In short, I watched myself from afar. I had no fears or worries and trusted that my family will take care of my funeral. <laughs> well, when I die, okay, that's good. I couldn't even feel much attachment and was peacefully waiting to finally leave this physical body. Is this happening because my imagination wasn't good enough? <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Um, I don't know. I, I think this is already quite... What you're doing here seems to be quite nice. Yeah, you're looking at yourself from afar. I think if that... Uh, uh, if you can do that and that works, then uh, you can start with that. Uh, and uh, maybe once you have done that a few times, then you can try to come from the other angle where you are actually in directly in the bed. You are actually there and you can feel the death process because it becomes much more personal, obviously, if you are there. Yeah, now it's happening to me. 
What does it actually feel like? And you can feel it more directly and immediately. And that is really the main point, because when you feel it, then you can feel the power of the letting go. And this is the purpose of this. Yeah, the purpose of the death contemplation is to learn to let go in this life before you are forced to do it at, at death. That is the point. So you use that peace in the present moment. So try, if this makes you peaceful and it works, you can do that. But eventually try also the other method of, from the first person perspective yeah, and see if that makes you even more peaceful perhaps. But only when you're ready. Yeah, if you feel it is fearful or too difficult, then let it be here. But if you're ready for it, then you can do it that way. Yeah. So see, play around a little bit. Don't, uh, you know, there is nothing really absolutely right or wrong with these things. It is ultimately what works that is important. Yeah. Okay, hi Ajahn, good day. Okay, <laughs> that's good. So that's the Aussie, Aussie way of starting out. So I'm an Aussie now, so that's, uh, you are getting right down to things. Would you kindly give us a brief run through or summary of the Four Noble Truths for the benefit of those who missed, who couldn't attend your meditation retreat? Yes, so let's do that at the last session. Yes, yeah, so we have two more sessions after this, if we are still uh, able to hang in there. and. Uh, so we'll do that at the last one. I'll just leave that there so that uh, I will remember that at that point. Hi Ajahn, it's a good reminder that we are all conditioned to behave and act the way we do, but is there a way to help people who are hurting themselves and others knowingly or unknowingly for the way they are being so deluded, uh, i.e. not knowing any other way or path? They are not interested in the Buddhist path or Dhamma, so can't bring them to attend any Dhamma talks. Uh, do we assume that they are not ready? Uh, that it's uh, their own conditioning and not for us to be able to help. Thank you. Um, yes, very often you can't help other people. Uh, very often people are stuck where they are and sometimes you just have to accept that. Uh, and uh, it's okay. If you think about the majority of the people in the world, uh, you're never going to meet them even. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. This person is probably just like any other one of those majority people in the world. Uh, it's just because you happen to know them that uh, you care and you want to do something. Uh, if you hadn't known them, there's billions of people like that out there. Uh, yeah, That's the reality. Can't do anything for them. And it's okay. Uh, so don't waste too much time trying to uh, help someone who is um, unhelpable. Uh, instead, uh, know that very often, just by being kind to people, uh, very often their hearts will open up just through kindness and living in the right way. As you say, they may not be ready, they may not be mature enough, uh, they may need to just get to the right stage, and one day they may, it may happen. It was interesting, because this is what happened to me as well, to some extent, in my own family. They, I, most of my family members, they took an interest in Buddhism, uh, at least after a while. Uh, but uh, the holdout was my sister. She, she wasn't really interested in Buddhism. Uh, she was just interested in running around and doing stuff and living the worldly life. Uh, and I think kind of she grudgingly respected what, what I was doing, but it wasn't... <laughs> it was difficult, yeah? So I, I sort of gave up. I didn't really ask her, say anything to her. Uh, and, but then when she got cancer, that was the big changing point, yeah? Then she took and started taking interest. Uh, it's as if you need uh, some of these devadutas. Uh, devadutas are the divine messengers uh, yeah, that remind you of the reality of life. Uh, and sometimes you need to feel it on your own very body before it makes sense to you. Uh, and then she came to me, and then she realized she needed to do something. So she asked me for talks about meditation practice and all these kind of things. Uh, and that changed her at least a little bit. Uh, and uh, very nice because when she died, then she wanted me to do her funeral ceremony. Yeah, so obviously that she respected me. Yeah. So I was the one who ended up doing her, her funeral ceremony at the very end. Uh, so she also came around. But uh, you know, basically I shrugged my shoulders and said I can't do anything for my sister and it's okay. And she came around anyway. And this happens sometimes. Uh. So just be wise and don't push if you feel too much resistance, otherwise often goes worse. And very much grateful for all your teachings and wisdom that you've given during these nine days. Okay, excellent. 
So, um, okay. Dear Ajahn, for those of us who die sudden deaths, e.g. due to accidents, uh, with no time to be uh, with the right frame of mind, where do they go, as they would normally be in shock or pain? Thank you. Well, this is the thing, yeah, is that uh, this is precisely why this idea of intermediate existence is so interesting here. Because when you have an intermediate existence, it means that the, there is time for your mind to balance out again. So if you die very quickly in an accident or uh, in a bad frame of mind or whatever, that is not the end of the story here. Because then you go to the intermediate existence and then you kind of balance out, you remember the good things you have done, you remember your whole life, and then that is what then drives you onto your next life. And this is why it makes a big difference, this idea of do we get reborn straight away or is there an intermediate existence? The reborn straight away idea means that the death moment is incredibly important because that will affect how you get reborn. But if there is an intermediate existence, then the death moment is not so important. What matters really then is your overall karma in your life. So I w to me, this is the, the obviously the right way of thinking about things. The death moment actually is not that important. Sometimes this is what you get to hear in Buddhist circles, yeah? Death moment is really, really important. Uh, but I don't think it is true, and I, don't th I think it goes against how the Buddha teaches in the suttas. It's all kamma-based, uh, yeah? The accumul accumulated goodness and or badness in your heart. Uh, that is what actually makes a difference. Uh. So, uh, yeah, so that doesn't matter all that much. That is my bottom line on that one. Are there any more questions? We have a few minutes left. Uh, is there anything anyone would like to ask? Uh, anyone would uh, want to say anything? Uh? Yes, please. Yeah, John. Uh, will you elaborate more about the uh, sati patana practice? Because you mentioned about um, it is incorporated in the uh, anapanasati. Okay, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so we're talking a bit about Satipatthana practice, and um, this is a very large topic, yeah. and sometimes we can teach a whole 10 day retreat just on Satipatthana Sutta, and nothing else. Uh, can do, but uh, I wouldn't recommend it, it gets too technical sometimes. Uh, but uh, the sim one of the simplest ways of thinking about Satipatthana is to, uh, again, go back to the suttas. And one of the things the Buddha says, which I always found very interesting, uh, is that uh, all, if you practice anapanasati, uh, you fulfill all four satipatthanas. Uh, yeah? So it is enough to do mindfulness of breathing. Uh. When you read the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, I mentioned the other day that the, main, the most important thing in the first part is the 31 parts of the body. The next one is the Vedana, Nupassana, contemplation of feeling, and it just lists a large number of feelings, uh, and you're supposed to know them. Uh. Then you have the Chitta, Nupassana, contemplation of mind, uh, yeah? it gives a large number of mind states that you're supposed to know. Uh. And then you have the Dhamma, Nupassana, and the two main things there is the contemplation of the five hindrances, uh, and the seven Bojanga, seven factors of awakening. Those are the two main ones. Uh. So that is how it is explained in the Satipatthana Sutta. Now, it is not clear, however, exactly how it is that you develop those things. For example, Vedana Nupasana, how do you develop that? Uh, how do you develop the Chitta Nupasana? Yes, you know the mind states, yes, you know the feelings, uh, but the context is not clear. Do you do it in ordinary life? Do you do it, how do you exactly do it? Uh, and that is where the Anapanasati Sutta is so incredibly helpful, because then the context becomes absolutely clear. The context is mindfulness of breathing. That's when you do it. Uh, I know that in many traditions they do it differently. For example, the Gwenka tradition is you start with mindfulness of breathing, then you go to the feelings of the body and these things. Yeah? And it's not necessarily wrong. I don't want to criticize them or say it's wrong or anything, but I would prefer to follow the way the Buddha lays it down. And he says you do it in the context of watching the breath. Because all of these feelings arise with the watching of the breath. So you know the breath, you know the feelings. And then you can contemplate them afterwards when you come out. Yeah? You can know what is happening here. And that is really, to me, the right process. So the whole thing happens in this way. Yeah? And then, as you become even more purified, uh, 
then there comes a point when uh, there's only the body starts to disappear, there's mostly only the mind left, yeah? This is equivalent to the citta nupassana of Satipatthana Sutta, because you have like the nimittas and you are kind of leaving the body behind. Uh, and then the very last part of the Anapanasati Sutta is about the final purification of the mind before you enter the jhanas. Uh, that is very similar to understanding the hindrances and developing the seven factors of awakening here. Uh, yeah, that you find in the Satipatthana Sutta. Uh, because that is all about eliminating the f refined hindrances, uh, building up the mind in pity and happiness and all of those things that eventually lead to jhana. That is exactly what happens in the very end. Actually, that, sorry, I'm confusing things a bit for you now, probably. The last four steps of Anapanasati Sutta, rather, should be the contemplation steps, the contemplation of Anicca, Viraga, Niroda, and Patanisiga. Are, are you with me? Am I being too technical? Are you following? Yeah? That's the last step, yeah? And that is all about understanding impermanence and fading away, and that then refers to the last Satipatthana of the five hindrances and the Bojangas, uh, because you understand how the hindrances fade away, how they disappear, uh, and then how, kind of, out of that, uh, you, you, you understand this whole process, basically, uh, including the, uh, yeah, the Bojangas, uh, whatever. Uh. So, um, yeah, so there's each tetrad of Anapanasati uh, fits with one of the four of the Satipatthana contemplations. Uh. Am I making any sense? Uh, yeah, are you sure? Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, fine, go away. Uh. During uh, Anapanasati, City. Usually one will get um, calm mm -hmm. and then uh, you have peace. And then uh, and I was told that this is not good. It's not good? Yeah. <laughs> it will be blocking you from reflection of your feelings yeah. and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's become a hindrance to you. Yeah, okay. So yeah. I uh, so yeah. need guidance on that. Okay. I, th th this is uh, just, uh, you know, I. We've just been reading some of the suttas where the Buddha says that uh, you know, the normal process of meditation is all about bliss and happiness. This is what the process of meditation is all about. Uh, and uh, the Buddha is teaching this is the way we should do things. Uh, yeah? So when people say that this is a hindrance, it, is kind of, uh, it goes directly against what the Buddha is teaching. I don't know how anyone can say that, to be honest with you. It is really, really silly. Uh, in fact, you need that bliss to have insight. Without that bliss, you cannot have insight. And the reason is because you need to, the process is a conditioned process, yeah? You have the piti, then the pasadi, then the sukha, then the samadhi, then the yata bhutanadasana. Yata bhutanadasana, knowing and seeing, can only happen based on samadhi. So you need to have samadhi first. Samadhi can only happen if you have bliss. Bliss can only happen if you are peaceful, yeah? So all of these things must be there. Yeah? So this idea is... Uh, is uh, unfortunate when people say that, because really it is very, very contrary to the suttas. And so I guess people who say that, they haven't really read the suttas properly. Uh, yeah, they are basing themselves on a tradition, come from some acharya, some teacher, uh, and are based on that without going back to really what the suttas say. If you read the suttas, there's like bliss and samadhi is everywhere. Yeah? Every other sutta talks about bliss and samadhi, it's that you can't avoid it. If the Buddha teaches it so much, how can it be dangerous? Uh, he doesn't say anywhere that it's dangerous. Yeah? So if the Buddha doesn't say it's dangerous, why, why would there anyone else? <laughs> so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up, to be honest with you. It is absolutely fundamental to the, uh, to the practice, and uh, without it, uh, um, and, and it's great, yeah, I mean the idea of Dhamma, it should be a happy path, we should enjoy it, it should be something that is really positive, even just practicing our ordinary virtues should be something we enjoy. Kindness is enjoyable if you know how to be kind, yeah, you feel good if you're kind, so kindness is a positive thing, yeah. and then everything is just more and more happiness. This is what makes this path so delightful, yeah, you don't become stupid by being happy, yeah. The contrary, you become wise from being happy here. Happiness leads to wisdom. This is kind of the thing here. Why? Because that happiness you have is a spiritual happiness. It is the worldly happiness that is dangerous. If you don't have enough spiritual happiness, you will cling to the worldly happiness instead. So not having enough spiritual happiness is actually dangerous, because it will lead you to go into sensuality instead, because you need some kind of happiness. Nobody can live without happiness. So if you don't find it on the spiritual path, you're going to find it in ordinary life. 
When the Buddha was on his way to awakening, he, he um, remember he gave up the idea, okay, so all this self-torment doesn't work, sensual indulgence doesn't work, and then he thinks, could there be another path to awakening here? And then he thinks, uh, it must be the jhana experience I had as a child, that must be the path to awakening here. And then he thinks, why am I afraid of that happiness? That has nothing to do with sensuality. Yeah, I should not be afraid of that happiness. That's, li that's what he says, yeah, quite literally. Yeah. Because that happiness is only, the, it's only the sensual happiness that is a problem. The mental happiness in meditation is a ma massive boost uh, to your ability to practice the path properly. Yeah. That is, as far as I'm concerned, that's the sutta. That's what the Buddha says. I, I, and I can't see any, any problem with that at all, to be honest with you. So enjoy, yeah, be happy, yeah, have a good time. That is really what the Buddha is saying to us. <laughs> okay, let's have a break and come back in at quarter to three here. Yeah.